All right. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Robert Wood. Uh, this is Will Bankston. Uh, we work at a, uh, a tech company up in San Francisco called Nuna Health, and we're going to be talking today about, uh, well, I won't spell out the title because it's rather long and arduous, but basically um, a little bit more focused topic around this whole uh, DevOps and security marriage um, and conversation that's been happening in recent years. So um, the crux of this talk, which we'll get into a little bit more, um, is focused on uh, building a, an, a completely automated and redeployable identity management service uh, slash stack for the company and how we did that and our plans to open source that and make it available to other companies who might be in similar situations and talk about if you're not in a completely one-to-one -one, uh, similar situation, how you might still be able to use some of the principles from this. Um, so. I mentioned we uh, both work in the security team at Nuna Health. Um, our, uh, we kind of live and breathe cloud security and automation as that's kind of the, the engineering culture at Nuna. Um, we have a lot of engineers that came from these uh, companies who also live and breathe this stuff like the Netflixes, the Googles, uh, Microsofts of the world. And so um, we're just all together trying to solve automation and security problems all the time in a very big data uh, environment. So um, that is us. So the problem statement, uh, basically what we're attempting to solve is that um, Nuna is somewhat of a hipster company. I'll use that term uh, a little bit in that um, it's kind of the, it's, it's this new modern type of company that basically everything you could think of runs on some cloud service, uh, one form or another. It's, uh, you know, email is run on some, on SaaS solutions, product infrastructure is hosted on AWS. Um, we really don't have the concept of a, uh, of users coming in, users being employees, coming into an office, uh, sitting in a spot in their cubicle and logging into their computer that is connected to their internal network, which then grants them access to some set of internal network resources that then allows them to do their job. Um, we do have an office, we do have seats, and we do have laptops, but the concepts that, uh, that would typically apply around internal networks and that, that gate that usually exists being the firewall between the outside world and the inside world being your company, uh, that doesn't really exist here. Our office is more like, it's like a really big Wi-Fi hotspot. It's like a really big Starbucks with free coffee. Um, so basically what we're trying to solve is, uh, is how do we build security, how do we bake security into that? And uh, what, we, uh, what we did is we have, we are using Active Directory for centralized identity management. Uh, we're using that to feed uh, feed single sign-on solutions. We're using that to drive um, drive identity for everything at Nuna. Um, it's not 100% complete yet. The stack is, but um, the integration, the service integrations with it are not yet complete yet. And what we're going to be talking about is how we, how we deployed all of that and where it might be useful uh, for some of you guys. So um, show of hands here, uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, how many of you guys come from a pen testing background or have done a pen test in the past? All right, so a pretty decent amount of folks have come from a pen testing background. So how many times do you end up using the same exact tricks uh, if you come from a network pen testing background to end up escalating your way up to domain admin or a somewhat high level user in a corporate infrastructure? I assume, all right, so a lot of the same tricks um, and we've, we've experienced that as well. So. Um, if we go to the next slide. So the traditional setup is that you end up having in some internal uh, corporate data center um, domain controllers that end up getting rolled in uh, what we call them uh, special snowflake ways. And they're completely undeployable. If they went down, it's a, you know, everyone is hair on fire. They don't know how to handle it. Um, it's just not a good situation for, for the organization. And as a result of those things just being special snowflakes and existing over time and evolving over time, um, you end up with a lot of these problems that just kind of evolve um, throughout the lifetime of that, of that identity management service being the domain controller cluster. And so you end up with service account credentials kind of sprinkled all over the place. Service, like domain admin credentials are used to, uh, to like handle printers, they're used to, um, they're provide to provided to vulnerability scanners to do vuln scans, they're provided all over the place. And you end up with all of these weird accounts added to domain admin groups. And therefore, if one of those uh, 
if one of those accounts gets compromised, that user has domain admin privileges, and then they can do whatever they want. Um, you also have all of these weird services that end up getting connected to domain admin, like connected to a domain over time. Um, that of course increases the attack surface in some in unnecessary ways in some places. Um, your users, um, so IT departments have. Uh, have evolved to kind of support users and uh, push out policies to users and we want all of our workstations joined to domains and um, administered by domains. Um, but as a result of that, if a workstation that is sitting on an internal network and therefore connected to an internal network, there's, there's a connection that resides between what is potentially an untrusted device. Even though it's being managed, um, I'm sure we all have familiarity with users sometimes doing foolish things or, you know, whether intentionally or unintentionally, or uh, you end up having, uh, let's say an attacker just walks into the office or somehow gets something else running on the network. Um, like if you end up uh, with somebody walking in the front door and plugging into your network, uh, in a lot of cases they can just get on and with that, uh, with that connection, either on a user's workstation or just on the internal network, they can, they can see the domain controller, they can interact with the domain controller. And that connectivity is another problem that ends up leading usually to, uh, through some form or another and some chain of exploits, you end up taking over that domain controller and therefore the network. Um, and these last ones are, uh, are really built on the fact that the traditional domain controllers having evolved over time out of being originally special hand-rolled snowflakes and having some other hand-rolled snowflakes to back it up, there's really, uh, you know, over time that the, the known state of those domain controllers and just the identity service as a whole, it, the amount that you know about it goes down over time. Um, and if you have to patch it, if you have to do something critical to administer it, um, it's usually a really scary thing to do that because you have to schedule downtime. Um, you don't really know for sure what those patches are going to do. It's, um, it's a scary thing. And uh, as a result of that, uh, we've both witnessed in a lot of companies uh, coming from a consulting background where uh, administrators just won't do that stuff because the, th the fear of bringing down a service that's critical uh, for the company is usually worse than leaving it unpatched and therefore having the risk of some, of some other critical vulnerability sitting there. So it's, it's, a, it's a balance between um, the confidentiality and integrity of uh, information on the environment and the availability of the environment if you start to think about the three properties of security. Um, and on top of that, um, we have Crackhead Joe here looking for uh, just one more, uh, one more exploit. Uh, so this is kind of the, uh, what we've seen in uh, uh, going to, like as, as time has gone on, uh, so I mentioned at the, the end of the last slide that, um, you know, the list of attacks on domain controllers and just uh, AD environments, you know, we, we see this stuff at security conferences over and over and over and over again. Um, there's always new stuff coming out, you know, there's like Patch Tuesday is a, is a thing, there's always new vulnerabilities coming out. Um, and so there's this never ending game of, of cat and mouse and with all of the other problems that exist there and new vulnerabilities constantly coming out, uh, we end up as administrators just constantly slapping band-aids onto, uh, onto our identity service stack. Uh, being the domain controllers, uh, which is which is unfortunate because the the issues around connectivity and the complexity with services constantly being integrated with those things, th those are still there. The underlying problems, so to speak, are still there, um, and they're not necessarily problems. They're just design <coughs> challenges that we have to work around, um, and therefore we just end up getting worse and iteratively worse and worse over time, which is an unfortunate state to be in. Um, and on top of that. Uh, has anyone in here dealt with any kind of forensics or data breach that they've had to either at their own company deal with or uh, been a consultant doing forensics for another firm? Show of hands. All right, so a few hands have gone up. So, um, so you guys are probably familiar with um, the fact that if, if a Windows environment gets breached, there's almost no good way to truly, truly know if there isn't some some form of persistence in that Windows environment, like there's so many ways that you can backdoor a system, um, it's not as it's not as obvious as you know some like hacked leap executable running on on boot every time that reaches out to you know evil.com on some weird port. Like it's it's not that straightforward. 
Um, there's so many weird things that can happen. And like attackers, if they crack credentials, if they're in that position of domain, con of domain admin and they just crack credentials and you're not rotating credentials, then they could just be using legitimate service accounts to still gain access to things. Um, so uh, we are here to tell you there's a better way if you are a hipster company like us. Um, so uh, what we did, and we can go to the next slide, is this automation stack that we built. Uh, as I mentioned, we are running everything in uh, the AWS uh, infrastructure as a service uh, realm, all of our product infrastructure and our identity management infrastructure. Well. 80% of our identity management infrastructure is in, uh, is in AWS. And the, these are some of the high level components that we use in our automation stack. So uh, is anyone familiar with CloudFormation, AWS CloudFormation? All right, so a few folks. Um, so let me set this coffee down. I tend to get animated with my hands and um, you guys are in a splash zone. Um, so CloudFormation is a templating system uh, that AWS provides. Basically you feed it as input a JSON template. And that template defines what either your entire infrastructure or a piece of your infrastructure should look like. So you can define VPCs, you can define subnets, you can define uh, IAM policies, you can define S3 buckets and subsequent policies that would be attached to that bucket. Uh, you can define policies around EC2 instances and how they get booted up. You can find all these wonderful things about how your AWS environment should behave. And then all that stuff lives in source code or in source control. And it's nice, neat, auditable. And there's, uh, there's version control behind it that you can go back and audit. You can roll back. You can do all these wonderful things. Um, the downside to CloudFormation is that it's, uh, it's kind of like a bull in a china shop carrying a sledgehammer. It's, uh, it's a very, very powerful tool. Um, but if you don't manage it properly and you make small changes and your templates aren't organized correctly, uh, you can blow away entire parts of your infrastructure. You can like you can screw a lot of things up really really quickly with CloudFormation, um, and so we'll talk a little bit about how to layer templates uh, in a more sane way. So that way you're not uh, that way you can make small changes to your infrastructure that don't uh, that don't affect anything below the layer at which it's organized. Um, for instance, the the parts of your infrastructure that should not change, like the VPCs and the subnets and such. Um, we're using Chef and bootstrapping scripts to, uh, to do server provisioning and server configuration um, and GPO uh, with, respect to the, um, with respect to the domain controller. So these three components here, um, primarily Chef and GPO for the, uh, for the domain controllers. Um, for anyone who's not familiar, Chef is, Chef is a, a configuration management and automation tool. Um, so in, in a very similar way that we define our infrastructure, being our network infrastructure with CloudFormation, we define how we want servers to look and feel and be configured with Chef. And so after CloudFormation runs, um, then Chef will run, take care of the server provisioning. We drop in a GPO policy that says in a more granular fashion, how exactly a domain controller or forest of domain controllers should be configured. And then we have, voila, a repeatable policy setting, uh, set of policies and settings on our domain controllers that we can spin up, spin down. Um, and then uh, with regards to access to that environment, um, access, and when I say access to that environment, I'm talking about access to administration, administrative capabilities to that environment. Uh, we're using Duo Security. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar with it, it's a cloud-based uh, multi-factor authentication tool that you can, you can protect RDP access, you can protect SSH services, you can protect any number of web apps. Um, it's pretty slick. Um, so we're using that to protect all of the, the ingress for, uh, for this stack. So these are just a couple of the layers um, that come into play with, uh, with CloudFormation templates. Uh, so as I mentioned, there's, there's things at the bottom, um, and this is, not, uh, this is not an exhaustive list, and Will will chat about this a little bit more in his, uh, uh, when he starts walking through this in a little bit more detail, the, uh, the actual process of spinning up, spinning down infrastructure. Um, but these are just some of the ways that you can organize uh, by service or by uh, function uh, CloudFormation templates. So um, the question then becomes for, you know, if we as, as IT administrators or as uh, people administering and, you know, defending networks, why we would want to spend the time to, to automate all of this stuff. Um, so there's obvious performance benefits. Um, you know, the, the DevOps community will talk about this at length, 
the fact that you can you can do rapid deployments and redeployments of components of your infrastructure. Um, that's awesome. Um, you know, they typically talk about that in like the Etsy and Groupon world, deploying application code for their for their products. Uh, but why can't we take the same tools and use them for our own services? Um, it's just us not really thinking about it that way. Um, as a result of everything living in source control, you can audit it really, really easily. Um, you don't need all of these crazy agents that need to be installed on systems and constantly running and monitoring things like a uh, like a bastardized version of antivirus uh, installed on everything and you know watching it for for weirdness. Um, you could do that as a as an additional uh, as an additional layered control in your environment, but really the the state of your servers should lie within the source code that defines how that server is to be provisioned and when you have those things you can audit changes over time from deployment to deployment you can build linters so that every time um, every time a configuration is to be changed you you audit against that linter and that linter could be mapped to some kind of regulatory compliance standard it could be mapped to internal security policy you know really whatever you you want to do but as Whenever a change is made to that, you run those set of automated checks. If you get any flags, you investigate why that is. Um, and then of course, you have a predictable state over time. And that's, that's kind of the benefit from a performance and DevOps standpoint. And the security benefits are almost exactly like we also inherit all of these things. It's terrific. Um, and then we also have some additional security benefits here. So the fact that we can spin up, spin down infrastructure whenever we want at the push of a button because everything is automated and, and beautiful. Um, our administrative infrastructure only needs to be up when we need it to be up. Um, so how many times, like for folks that, that have familiarity dealing with uh, administering domain controllers or other high availability systems, um, in our experience anyways, and this, this could vary between company to company, but folks usually aren't logging into those systems constantly to change things because their high availability, that because they demand high availability, you don't want to be screwing with things that could impact that availability. It's the same principle as patching it and potentially causing it to go down or potentially breaking something. Um, that fear of screwing something up or doing that, making that one configuration change that causes the whole thing to set on fire, um, it's a scary thing. So why do we, why do we need the, the capability to administer it sitting up and potentially susceptible to attack 24-7, 365. Um, we argue that we don't. And so, therefore, um, using CloudFormation and Chef and bootstrapping scripts and such, um, what, we've, what we've built really centers around um, with that infrastructure separated and sitting off in AWS um, and completely segmented from, from the world as we know it, um, we don't have VPN access, network routes, um, well, network routes controlled by security groups. We don't even have that stuff available if it's not needed. And so we're using the concepts presented here to spin up that infrastructure for only time we need to administer a service, being the identity management service, and then we spin it down afterwards. So there's no, um, there's no lagging time that a VPN is sitting out there waiting to be, uh, waiting to be taken over by you know, some crazy zero day, anything like that. So if we, if we have a zero day that comes out, we don't have to worry about you know, we can, we can look at our configuration, manage it that way, and deploy it in the test environment, make sure we're not susceptible to said zero day. Um, or we just leave, leave that connection down until a patch is sorted out or, you know, workaround is, is developed and, and published, what, what have you. So we don't have to leave ourselves susceptible to those things, um, and we don't have to leave ourselves susceptible to the, we forgot that system existed, so it just kind of lived on and became vulnerable over time. Um, that's another that's another easy way in for a lot of attackers is they just find some system that kind of snuck snuck away from the typical uh, the typical enterprise IT management um, umbrella that that gets created over time um, and then you just have these special snowflakes sitting out in the world with a bunch of customer data or you know access to something um, I mentioned this before but um, Basically, with everything living in source code, we can, of course, back, we can, of course, audit that with very focused static analysis. Um, to audit these things, you don't need these big heavyweight fortifies and varicodes and things like that. Um, you really just need simple Python scripts and such, or you know, whatever your, your automation language of choice is, to just check that 
what you see in source is what you expect to see um, or check for the presence of potentially odd known security risks. Um, and of course, with everything living in source, you can enforce, uh, you can enforce Git uh, check-in reviews that um, let's say Will wants to make a change to our identity management stack and we need to have a, another manual peer review of any changes to that stack. And so when he checks that change into Git, um, it, can go through, uh, it can go through a manual peer review by me or another member of our team, and, uh, or you could even have it be a cross-team collaboration thing, so that way you don't have, um, you don't have folks just you know, tapping their neighbor on the shoulder and saying, you know, hey, buddy, can you, uh, can you just approve that really quickly? I just want to get it, just want to get it into production. Um, you can actually enforce checks and balances through this kind of process. So um, I'm going to hand this over to Will. He is going to do a little bit more detailed walkthrough of uh, what exactly we built. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Bob. So as Bob mentioned, uh, CloudFormation, really cool stuff. Uh, it opens the world to new, unique ways of preventing your infrastructure from being exploited or potentially exploited for too long. Uh, with any advanced persistent threat, they tend to move slowly to be undetected. So what happens if you are completely rolling your stack every week that advanced persistent threat loses their persistence if they have exploited you every week, basically. So you can choose to, in our, in our stack that we'll walk through here, we could ideally every evening re-roll our identity management stack and have a complete uh, Active Directory identity management stack brand new every morning when we walk in the office. So if you exploited us the night before, you have to exploit us again the next day. Uh, Patch Tuesday comes around, all those patches are automatically applied when we bring that new infrastructure up, and now you're having to find a new way in. Um, there's things at, from an attack perspective, if uh, I think, oh, well, if you're building your images off this golden image, and I can get in and I can you know, build backdoors in that golden image, then I have a permanent backdoor. Well, what happens if we build our golden image new every time? And with things that we're doing here, and I'll walk through these in uh, a little more detail here in a second, we can rebuild our, Im our images that we base things off of, where if you think you're going to exploit us through backdooring one of our images, you're really going to go have to backdoor Amazon image first, because of all, all our base AMI, AMIs are based off of that. Um, so you have a bigger target on, you know, that you have to actually, bigger yeah, bigger hurdle to actually get to us. Um, and in that case, you've got everyone, because, you know, everyone else is using the Amazon images for the most part. And, you know, not, I don't know too many companies that are building AMIs from scratch and uploading them into the cloud um, custom. They're, they're basing things off of known, good, uh, proven, true AMIs and modifying those. Uh, so we mentioned our, our stack and how we're doing it. Uh, so in our IDM stack, we have an only on VPN. Uh, you should only have access to get to our AD if you need to get to the AD to administer. Um, if you need a remote desktop into our AD infrastructure, you're going to have to have a VPN access and route to that AD. Um, that security group for the, the port 3389 is only going to be available at certain times. That VPN won't exist unless it actually needs to exist. And with CloudFormation, in a matter of five minutes, I can press a button and the VPN be up and running with our keys ready to go, uh, protected by two-factor authentication, push technologies, um, all sorts of different things in a known true secure state so that we can control ins and outs of our VPC at all times. Um, with our VPN, we have our dedicated network stack. So we're only pushing routes to certain people on that VPN, and those routes only exist based on security groups that are set within the VPC and uh, any additional security groups that are applied to instances within the VPC itself. Um, whenever we roll or, del or delete a stack, um, whatever changes we've made have automatically get rolled back. And if there's any errors that we create in pushing a stack that uh, violate Amazon policy or any of our internal policies, they get auto-rolled back to a known good state. Um, we use HashiCorp Packer to build custom AMIs. Um, so we'll, we'll take a good Amazon AMI, push our own scripts, add Splunk forwarders, add Duo, you know, every, whatever else hardening we want to do to our to build our custom Nuna AMI, and then make that available to our VPC in order to run instances off of. Um, it's really cool stuff. Uh, it's, it goes right alongside back to the code review standpoint. 
we don't have to go into the AMI and manually look around to see what's installed. We can go look at a source code file, a JSON template, and see, okay, this AMI is built based off this base Ubuntu image. It has Duo installed. It has these default users. It has a Splunk forwarder being set to this. Um, you know, we tear down this. It's endless, however you want to customize it. It's code reviewed. Um, we can all, we adopt the DevOps perspective in that we can have automated build validation. Uh, if if things are outside of our the policy rules that we define, they can automatically be rejected. Um, there, it's not a manual process. We build automation into that as well. Um, and with the adopting the latest AWS technologies, we can actually encrypt our boot volumes, um, do some really cool things that not many people are doing yet. Uh, and as Bob mentioned, chef bootstrapping. So a lot of the Windows environments, we don't want to have to go in and manually uh, stand those up ourselves. So we'll cloudform the instance and then have chef finish that uh, bootstrapping for us. Um, and even our chef server is bootstrapped. So we'll bootstrap ourselves and then bootstrap everything else. Um, pretty cool stuff. So at any time, if we ever felt like we were in a not good state in our identity management stack, we could press the delete button and redeploy. Um, and Bob mentioned forensics earlier. If we ever felt we we're in a state that we don't know what happened, we don't have time to investigate at risk of something else being exploited, we can take snapshots of our entire environment, delete it, stand up a new instance, and then go take those snapshots and do our forensics investigation off of those. Um, so we don't have to keep our exploited environment up and running or keep anything down for an extended period of time leaving our users unavailable to do work. We can do things really rapid and move forward and make progress without halting our production at work. Yeah, and one other thing to mention with the, uh, with the forensics is, so we do restrict network egress on all of the domain controllers and basically everything in this stack except to select whitelisted, uh, whitelisted targets that are, that are customers of the service, uh, of the identity service. So. Um, with that, if an, if an attacker were to compromise one of these servers, they have to figure out a way to exfiltrate any data or get it out of the AWS environment. Um, since it's not in a server in a closet in some uh, mom and pop shop, they can't just stick a USB drive in, dump everything to that USB and walk out the front door. Um, they do have to figure out an intelligent way to get out. And as Will mentioned, if we can just destroy it on a daily basis and stand back up to a known good state, like they lose all of that progress and they would have to figure out another way in. And by that time, the, the network routes and everything to even get to it are, are gone because we wouldn't be administering it. So, um, yeah. Right, yeah, if that same vulnerability exists every day, it doesn't solve the, we can't be exploited every day. Um, so if there's zero days that they're using, we're still susceptible to that. Um, but we, the attackers would be forced to have to change their tactics and techniques. They'd have to move a lot faster, and they might not be used to that. So we could throw them off that way. Um, but the fact that if they're using a certain zero day that they were able to execute with it when a certain network route was there, and then the next day that network route's not there, then we could protect ourselves from that. Um, but yeah, it still doesn't solve a zero day problem uh, until not patches. Entirely. Not entirely, yeah. There's some. There's some mitigation techniques, but. Right, well, yeah, we assume that the, the attack would take more than one day to get into our infrastructure, find what they're looking for, and get that data. Yep, and that's why uh, something like that, we have our advanced monitoring solutions in place to detect that you know something's not right. So it, it doesn't necessarily, uh, protect us against, you know, a, a super advanced attack, you know, a malicious insider that knows our infrastructure, knows where things are. Um, and can take advantage of, like, a 10-minute window to administer yeah. something. Um, um, they would have to know our maintenance cycles. They'd have to know when we're planning to do things. Um, but since there aren't ways into our directory all the time, you know, our attack surface is severely limited compared to other environments. So we had the, the only on VPN, which is up only when we need to administer things. Um, dedicated network stacks that are p pushed out with that VPN and uh, whatever instances we have rolled into our 
IDM stack as well. This includes, you know, our VPCs, our subnets, our, our routes in and out, uh, public routing, internal routing tables. Uh, we have a, a NAT device for internal servers that need to get updates through, you know, Patch Tuesday, our WSS server that needs to pull updates to distribute out to the rest of the environment. Uh, S3 endpoints for backing up known configuration states, pulling configuration scripts, you know, things like that. Um, we have dynamic network routes, uh, very auditable. You know, I'll sh I'll, we're going to try to run through a demo here real quick uh, that just show you that not only is it auditable from a standpoint that from a code review, you can basically do secure code review on your entire infrastructure and what your, your system images look like from a compliance standpoint, uh, from a security standpoint, from a just known good corporate. These, this sort of uh, port open on this device would break corporate policy type deal. Um, but you can also configure AWS to do automated checks for that. If a jump box was thrown up during these periods of time with this port open to the world, automatically terminate that device. So we don't have to be there constantly monitoring. We have things that do that for us. Or as I'll show in, a, in the demo, uh, our known good state that's checked in with Git and configuration managed, we can actually run that every day if we wanted to make sure that no changes have been pushed to the system. Because you're pushing stacks with CloudFormation, uh, AWS can check and see that state versus what you're trying to push again. And if there's any any changes that, if I if I made a change that Bob didn't know about and then he went to run it, he would see that change without having to go into Amazon to look at that. Or if an attacker were to get into the infrastructure and we detected a change, we could automatically roll back yep. um, if, it wasn't, if there wasn't something in change control for it. And with Amazon command line, we can programmatically query what our corporation, our corporate network looks like, what instances we have running, what security groups are out there, and run those against a set of policies that we set. Are there any uh, IP seeders that exist outside of what we have clearly defined? Are there any ports open that shouldn't be opened? If we have port 22 opened, is it only from the VPN security group, or is there an instance that's open to the world that violates our policies? Um, automated checks, automated alerts, automated terminations, if we deem that appropriate. Um, so I mentioned security code review, um, very nice. Uh, we've caught a lot of things in the past. Did you mean to have this port open? Uh, did you mean to open these ports from this security group? Uh, this is a cyclical uh, inclusion on security groups. Uh, do you know what that really means? Things like that. Um, and Bob talked about cross-team collaboration in those reviews. A lot of times it's not just a review amongst the security team, it's a review of security some people from engineering and DevOps to make sure that we're doing things in uh, the best fashion. Um, and so we built a lot of tooling around that. Uh, when we build our custom AMIs, we have custom macros in place. So if we roll a new instance overnight, it's automatically going to pull the latest approved and validated encrypted AMI down. Um, so you're not having to constantly update your templates to reflect new AMI IDs, new security group IDs, et cetera. Uh, so this is an example of a VPC that we're going to attempt to uh, deploy in the time remaining uh, and walk through what the actual templates look like. Um, it looks a little bit better in the slides, so you guys will be able to see that when... Uh, yeah. So real quick, walking through what an actual template in CloudFormation looks like. Uh, Bob talked about it being JSON. We actually write all of our, our templates in YAML, and our tool will convert the YAML to JSON and then push that to, to AWS as well. So it's, it's very convoluted at, in the beginning when you look at how to write these templates, but as you write more and more, it becomes second, second nature. Um, and the nice thing is you can pull from other templates as an example. So this is a very simple uh, template. I guess I should mention this isn't our IDM stack that we're showing today, but just pieces of how we put the stack together. Um, and the, the, eventually the, the IDM stack and bootstrapping process will be open sourced, available online. Uh, once we finish cleaning it up and make that available. Uh, but you define outputs. Um, so at the end of this script, we will actually output this information to the console window so that we can see and pull those IDs from there. But uh, we basically have defined a public route table, private route table, uh, a DMZ subnet, an internal subnet, and a test subnet. Um, we want an internet gateway because we need to be able to reach the internet from private subnets. 
Um, we want a uh, we need to attach that gateway to the VPC. Uh, we want a default public and internal route. Uh, we want the NAT device in order to have that connection to the gateway from the internet. Um, and here we've made uh, simple rules that uh, we're going to allow ingress from uh, to any of these uh, <coughs> excuse me internal IPs uh, on any port. Uh, we don't have any egress um, rules by default. Uh, in AWS CloudFormation, if you don't explicitly set egress rules, um, they just kind of mirror your ingress openness. Um, and then we define a NAT instance, and then our subnets are defined and what seeders we want them to have. Um, and then the overall VPC, this uh, 10 lines of code is basically all that's needed if you wanted to deploy a VPC without any subnets in it. Um, one thing to note with when you're deploying a virtual private cloud in AWS, you can add to it as much as you want. You can't take away. So once I've defined a subnet, I can't remove that subnet, especially if you've attached devices to it. Um, so, But if I've only uh, defined three subnets and then later on I decided that I want to define two more, you can actually go add those subnets to it. Um, so if you deployed at, at one point without the idea that you wanted a uh, relational database system instance hosted from Amazon, and then you find out, oh, crap, I need two more subnets in order to support that, you can easily go add that. So you don't have to clearly define out what your VPC is going to look like from the get-go. You just need the base concepts in the beginning. Um, so I'm going to launch this, and hopefully it works while we talk through the next slide, and we can actually see um, what it looks like. So we run this, we have this tool called uh, CF Run. Um, so we can see here that it converted it to JSON, it uploaded it to S3, which is what Amazon actually uses to pull the template into CloudFormation. And then we have a continuous check while it goes to create. Um, and so if something happens, we'll see it print out here that, hey, something happened, let's roll this back and get to a, a known good state. Um, and then also if you went to the actual AWS CloudFormation console, we would see that, hey, this stack is being created. And if you can actually go through event table and see what piece of the CloudFormation process you're at. Um, so we'll let this run. It takes about two minutes. Um, but we'll go into what a simple security group looks like. Um, just for This will be the next thing that we CloudForm and look at. Um, <clears throat> so it's very similar in structure. Uh, it's YAML once again. But we can go through and set uh, very specific security groups for instances or a broader spectrum like this is what our internal web servers security groups will look like, this is what our VPN security group will look like. Um, so I've defined here a separate, a simple security group for VPN that allows uh, outbound access on port 22 to be able to get into any of our uh, SSH instances inside our VPC. Uh, it has outbound access to the world on 44380 and uh, UDP uh, port 123 for network time protocol. Um, and of course, inbound access from a small subset of the, the world um, on port 1194. Uh, and if I wanted to open this to the entire world, I could say um, zero, zero. Um, if I define an internal web security group, uh, I could define similar outbound access, except I don't want to be able to pivot from a web uh, server to go to any other server. Um, except for on these ports. Um, and then these examples here are a way of uh, actually defining how to s reference a security group from another security group. So on port 22 inbound to the web server, I want to allow SSH access from the VPN security group. I want to allow 443 access from uh, the VPN or if in this case, I also want to allow 443 access from the world if they can get to it. Um, so let's quickly, we're running out of time, uh, but we can see that this creation is complete. If I go into the, to view it in the designer, it looks like the image that I had up on screen earlier. Um, and I don't have time to run through the security group one, but I can show you that if I were to run this VPC again, it will actually look at our tool looks at what was deployed and what's trying to be deployed and show me that there's no differences. And I can say, yeah, let's continue to deploy it. But it'll actually say there's no updates to be performed, so let's not do anything. Um, so this would be an, an, a thing saying, at the end of the day, I could run the script and say nothing's changed. We're in a, we're in a known good state. Um, but we'll, let, we'll wrap it up, and I'll let Bob uh, talk off the wrist. 
right. So um, moving past uh, moving past what we've talked about today. So um, and and wrapping things up. So um, basically, what we what we would urge basically everyone to do, not just not just the hipster companies like us, um, is using some of these using some of these technologies uh, even in the larger corporate environments. Uh, you can still albeit not using AWS uh, if you're not if you're not an AWS shop you can still utilize things like chef things like puppet salt ansible there's a zillion of these technologies popping up um, we just happened to choose chef because because we liked it um, and it was more programmatic than uh, than puppet that was more shell scripty um, is start to try to take advantage or you know look for things in your infrastructure that you can automate um, so that you can achieve some of the benefits of the DevOps uh, the DevOps benefits that we mentioned earlier, the the known good state, the auditable configurations, the the redeployments as you want them, and with those things, um, uh, you know, burning something to the ground uh, if you suspect a compromise. Uh, we oftentimes got this question when we were consulting, and you know, we'd take over a domain controller, and somebody would ask us like, "How do we know with all certainty that this hasn't happened to us before?" And you know, there there is no good way to answer that except for burn it to the ground and start fresh and uh, you know build it a little bit more securely that time which that that's not a really good answer from a consulting perspective but it it really is one of the only answers that that if somebody wants to make absolutely sure that there is no persistence uh, from an unauthorized entity being an attacker in their environment that that's really the only the only good way and it's not feasible without these kind of principles in place on your infrastructure um, and of course with if you are a hipster company, uh, you should be able to take uh, all or at least some of what we've built here and apply it in your own infrastructure. If you're starting to move things over to AWS or you wanted to adopt this and even test it out to see if it worked for your company. Um, or if you are, uh, you know, larger corporate environment, you should be able to just take the chef, uh, the chef components, the bootstrapping components and the GPO policies and such and utilize those. You don't have to, it's not an all or nothing approach. Just on that, um, this technology stack isn't just something that you can apply to your identity management stack or solution. It's something that that's where we started and proved out that we could do this and do it effectively and uh, securely. Um, but since then, everything else, uh, it's basically a policy at our company now that if you want a new server instance, if you want to deploy a new technology stack, it has to be cloud formed and bootstrapped. It has to be auditable through a, a code review process and repeatable into a known good state. So at any time, if we need to tear down and redeploy, we can do that uh, and migrate. If, if for some reason AWS West is not performing to our expectations, we can tear down and migrate to AWS East um, overnight without you know, causing any delays in our product. Um, so it's, a, it's something you can do learn it, do it well, do it securely, and then push it out across the corporation, not just your identity, identity management. That's where we started it, that's where we proved it out, uh, and that's where we're just continuing across our enterprise. Yeah, the reason we, we wanted to talk very specifically about the, like we do a lot of this with our, uh, our product stuff, but there's been a lot of research and everything in the product world on doing automation. So we wanted to show that this can be applicable to, uh, uh, to other, uh, other parts of the company. And last slide. Um, so future plans, uh, we mentioned this, that as soon as we get things cleaned up, uh, we will be open sourcing the entire stack um, from top to bottom uh, out to the world on our, uh, on our public GitHub repo. Um, uh, we will be, uh, well, we want to ideally uh, hook the, the tear, tear down and build up provisioning process into uh, more of a centralized administrative portal. So that way nobody has to deal with uh, Nobody has to deal with the command line, basically provisioning the provisioner um, through a, an easy to define administrative interface. So you can just say, I, I need to get to this, um, create it, create the routes for me, give me my keys and I'll get in and I'll get in with my, my least key. And be, like that least key will already be mapped to my, uh, my mobile device for 2FA and I'll get in, do my thing. And that least key will be automatically configured to expire after six hours or whatever the case is, whatever we define as a, as an expiration limit. Um, and that is the end of our presentation. So. I know we're out of time, but we'll, if you guys have questions, we can chat outside. Oh, oh okay. excellent. Cool. Um, so questions? So you guys have no active directory infrastructure at all? Not 
in our office. So we do have, like, this is all Active Directory infrastructure. It just, uh, the question was, we do we have any Active Directory infrastructure? And uh, it, it all just exists in AWS land. It's not... It's not in our office. You don't like sneak into the back, uh, into the back closet and find it. You know, find it running on a server there. It's it's all it's all there. And then that does selective outbound access to single sign-on providers to provide other access to the cloud services that we're using as an as a as a company. So, are you using Amazon as an IDP for other service providers, or you have a separate IDP that you're so Am Amazon doesn't actually exist as the as the service provider. Um, the service provider is, or the the identity provider is Active Directory. It's just hosted on AWS servers. So, so our Active Directory is feeding our IDP that handles our authorization to our other infrastructure and uh, applications. Okay. So it's it's our identity backbone, our true source of identity that feeds our IDP solution. So it's handling those sessions for so us. So you have your domain controllers running in AWS that feeds other parts of the environment. You didn't, you know, kind of just, you, you d still have that Microsoft piece in there. Yes. It's just cloud-based. Yes. Correct. Okay. Yeah, it's just cloud-hosted. Um, and, you know, you, as, with regards to IDP, so, you know, we're using a cloud-based solution. You could use something like, uh, I said I saw posted, uh, Amazon posted a paper on it. Um, there's a, there's a couple of other uh, IDPs that you can like build, you know, build yourself. Then you have to build all the SAML integrations and all of that. We we chose to go something with a lot less management overhead and something that we couldn't potentially screw up because SAML and OAuth and all of that is a compli is is complicated. There's there's a reason that a bunch of PhDs work on it and uh, it's already something that's figured out for us. So we chose to go the easier, less managed route. So, uh, but it's all backboned by this. Any other questions? Uh, so the question was regarding uh, uh, whether we have defined downtime requirements or whether we have, uh, alternatively, whether we have high availability requirements and how we how we manage that. Um, so we right now, like we have a high availability high availability requirement in the in the sense that our um, our users really want to be able to access everything at all times. Um, it's more it's more driven by them as opposed to regulatory compliance requirements. Um, how we manage that is we don't have to take down the uh, the whole thing at the same time um, because we have redundant. Do so the domain controller setup is is designed for high availability high availability purposes. So there's a set of two and two. Um, one uh, those those pairs work as a uh, primary and failover, and we can tear down the primary set, um, you know, spin those back up to a known good state, and then. Uh, while those are down and being rebuilt, uh, the backup set primary and, and failover will function as the source of identity. So that's how we handled that's how we handled that uh, that HA requirement. We do a lot of DevOps blue green deployment as well. So as we're bringing up new solutions and new stacks, uh, we can with a touch of a button switch everything over and operate on a different system and then tear down that other system. So we, in in essence, we could tear down and have a period, you know, an hour of unavailability while we rebuild, or we could have that new system up, switch over, and then tear down and have no roll, you know, a, a split second rollover, um, which shouldn't interrupt anything. Um, but you, with, you know, all the automation and stuff, you can define those maintenance periods and say during this time we will be down. So if you have work or scheduled jobs, you know, you need exclusions or coordinate around that as well. Uh, if you guys have any other questions, we can talk outside or uh, you can email us at Nina. Uh, we're happy to answer anything. Thank you.